What would the world look like if every woman who dared to dream big could reach her fullest potential? Where would we be if all visionaries had a space to develop, mold and set their ideas free? We are that space. We are that community. Open and diverse, vibrant and unafraid, allies to trailblazers, believing in the potential of all impact entrepreneurs, always reaching backwards, pulling each other up, smashing all ceilings. When we play the game, we define the rules. Seeking solutions to our Earth's greatest problems. When the world shouts out in need, our innovators answer. Manifesting the unbelievable into the tangible. Starting from nothing and building, staring down all possibilities, pushing aside all improbabilities. Refusing to be defeated. Adapting and evolving into something much bigger than ourselves. Using the full force of bold creation to keep the momentum rippling and rising. If there is a way, we will find it. If there's a solution, we will discover it. Magnifying voices that should not be ignored, providing light to hopes that should not be buried. We may come from different cultures. We may hold different beliefs. We may have different identities, but together, we are building the foundations of a global awakening where everyone has a chance to flourish, where powerful sparks are transformed into concrete realities, where innovative creations are pushed across the world by the strongest of currents, amplifying the endless potential of humankind. Thank you so much for joining our Founder Showcase today. I hope you're enjoying SOCAP. My name is Ming. I'm the head of community and content at the Cartier Women's Initiative, a philanthropic project of Cartier. So 15 years ago, we embarked on a journey to support women entrepreneurs leading early stage impact-driven businesses. And uh, 15 years later, now we've supported over 260 fellows from over 60 countries. Um, over the years, we have found that a specific phase of early stage entrepreneurship can be particularly challenging for women entrepreneurs. Once their businesses prove their product market fits, um, they often find it difficult to secure institutional financing or achieve sustainable profitability. It is on this stage that we want to focus. This is the missing middle that we want to focus on. So today you're going to hear from eight founders working industries as diverse as wastewater management, healthcare, and cultural preservation. They all share one common passion, which is to leverage the power of business to solve some of the most challenging issues of our time. Before I invite our first founder on stage, I would like to introduce all of you to a special guest today. Her name is Lu Zan, and she is the founder and managing, managing partner of Fusion Fund. Lu is an entrepreneur, an investor, and a mentor, and we're extremely proud to count her as one of our jury members. Please welcome Lou. Thank you, Moon. I'm very glad we get a chance to meet everyone here and also welcome everyone joining us for this awesome uh, women pitch session. So as an honor Cardiac Women Initiative jury member, I've been wi working with this great initiative for the past couple years. I still remember you know, how impressive all the pitches we went through during the selection period and how hard for us to make the decision to choose the final awardee. So today I'm super excited and also really looking forward to the pitch gonna bring, bring by our awesome eight founders uh, from the Cardiac Women Initiative community and welcome and also congratulations. So I was an entrepreneur myself. I was a female entrepreneur running my own medical device company in Silicon Valley. 
uh, before I went to the dark side, become an investor. So I definitely be on the two sides of the table, really experience the first the opportunity and also the power bring by the social impact and also especially tech innovation entrepreneurship. But on the other side, I truly understand how challenging for a female founder to be able to get support, get funding, also even just be recognized about their value in this community. That's also the motivation for me, you know, when I was a founder, I tried very hard, fight the battle to show that with a great technology, with a great founder capability, and also with a great market focus, we could really build a company, not only just create a great financial return, but also generate a huge social impact. That's the reason we highlight diversity. When we talk about the diversity, it's critical you know, to innovation. It's not only about just the impact value. It's about doing the smart thing, doing the right thing, and also be able to generate sustainable, better financial business results and bring the better value serve underserved market to this industry. So we saw that numbers getting better. I'm so glad we're seeing all this number, no matter it's from Harvard Business School or from other research institutes, showing that female-led startup female-led enterprise are having average much better performance compared with the industry. And meanwhile, as now a fund manager, I start Fusion Fund in 2015. We've been really actively supporting minority female funders since then. I'm really glad that we could support a group of awesome founders in the community and meanwhile be proactively promote to let more investors see the value of the founder and, uh, and also the female founder company lead by the female founder as well. So I hope today with the pitch presented and our CWI founders could really show you the awesome initiative they're working on and also truly let us all get together believe the one thing we always talk about in Silicon Valley which is change the world, create value, but the most important thing is to change the world and the most powerful and effective tool for us to drive social impact is really entrepreneurship and also technology innovation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lou. So without further ado, I'm going to invite our first founder today. So our first founder is a, a social entrepreneur and an artist. She has a decade of experience bridging indigenous communities, tech, and fashion companies to um, build a more equitable and sustainable world. Her company, Root Studio, uh, is on a mission to bridge cultures and reverse cultural loss through beauty and wonder. Please welcome Rebecca Hui. Thank you, Meng. Root Studio is reimagining cultural sustainability through digital licensing by bridging communities globally into the $32 billion fashion and retail industry. The reputation we've really been able to create in the cultural zeitgeist is what if you can connect the communities who are authentically living with the land and also understand the power of the seed to a massive multi-billion dollar market that is really looking for answers and authenticity but don't really know where to find it. Um, so to give you a little bit of a backdrop of how I started on this journey, I spent 10 years working with indigenous communities and I was so inspired by the ways in which they are connected to farming practices and as producers of their own materials. Um, and what you see is just this incredible amount of creativity. But the ways in which this is getting out for them is generally in typical artisan business models that are not exactly scalable. Because just imagine how long it would take to get one of these items all the way to an end consumer. And then you keep the artist in the position of a laborer and they still have to find alternative income. Um, simultaneously, you have these massive brands that are looking for inspiration every single season. They spend north of 300K a year just to travel to these countries, take inspiration, and it ends up on one of their collections. Um, one fashion collection on average that has a lot of quote unquote ethnic designs on average makes at least $3.8 million. So we connect these two worlds together. We build the foundations between indigenous communities and global fashion brands through the touch point of our heritage library. We run the largest library with over 10,000 unique assets that are traceable back to every single artist and community. We work with artists that were practicing matrilineal tattooing traditions to the backdrops of village theater, and we train artists to digitize their work, running monthly workshops that are then submitted into the archive, segmented by incoming trends that can be uh, rented for a season. 
Um, on top of that, it's not just about the artwork, it's the holistic context in which the art is from. So there's also a large editorial level archive of photo, B-roll, first person um, conversations from the artists and communities sharing their knowledge and information. So to show you end to end some of the collaborations we've done, here's a community from uh, Maharashtra in India. It's traditionally done on house walls. We digitized the artwork and a brand from the Pacific Northwest Outdoor Research licensed it in 2019. They said the hoodie sold out within two months. And it was also one of the largest injections of capital back to the community because we do a community dividend fund rather than a one-time artist injection. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> so it went so well that they continued to do three years of partnerships with us. And on average, all the brands we partner with have retained, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> uh, <laughs> um, on average, we see that everyone that we work with will continue to partner with us for multiple seasons. And we are backed by some of the most influential uh, leaders in the cultural zeitgeist across fashion and retail, which has enabled us to release more than 5 million products that impact cultural sustainability with um, doubling our revenue every single year and tripling the annual household income of the artists that we work with. We work now globally across 6,500 um, artists. So, but we're not stopping just at fashion and retail. We really believe that the potential for creativity amongst rural indigenous communities is much larger than what we've already accomplished. Um, if you're interested in joining our financing round, come to me afterwards and then you can see there's alignments and I'm happy to share more financials um, if you're a fashion and retail partner, we're always looking for values aligned partners. And if you are representing an artist or community, we would love to get you in touch with our community organizing team. Thank you. So uh, the second founder that you're going to hear from today, uh, her story is also about roots. So 10 years ago, she moved to a remote mountain village in rural China, following the uh, footsteps of her ancestors going back 14 generations. And it was there that she rediscovered her ancestral roots and was inspired to launch a zero carbon women's wear line using um, ancient techniques and uh, down by indigenous tribes. Please welcome Angel Chen. Hi, I'm Angel Chang. I'm the founder of the world's first zero carbon women's wear line. I've been designing for the last 18 years, starting at fashion brands like Donna Karen in New York, Chloe in Paris, and more recently at Lululemon. And it was while working at these brands that I discovered how polluting the fashion industry is and gave TED Talks to raise consumer awareness about this. Fashion is one of the most polluting industries in the world. It's run on fossil fuels and contributes up to 10% of global carbon emissions. Most clothing today is made from plastics and chemicals that are harmful to workers, to the environment, and to the skin on your body. And so there is growing demand for sustainable clothing. However, style, fit, and sustainability rarely converge. While most eco brands target younger consumers at the lower price point, luxury consumers are being left out. They also desire sustainable clothes, but few of these brands cater to them. And so at Angel Chang, we design for luxury consumers and their refined taste by offering zero carbon women's wear that's natural and handmade by indigenous tribes in the mountains. For the past 10 years, I've been working with Miao and Dong ethnic minority grandmothers in Guizhou province in rural China to create clothes made seed to button entirely by hand without electricity using ancient techniques that follow the cycles of nature. We use just three ingredients, sun, plants, and mountain water, which has led us to features in Vogue, Departures, T Magazine, and the Financial Times. By harnessing the traditional craftsmanship, we've created the world's first ever zero carbon women's wear line we are the category leader in zero carbon living, and we sell the aspirational lifestyle of a zero carbon future, one that is optimistic, healthy, and more beautiful than today. 
So after eight years of development, Angel Chang launched successfully in 2020 at the height of the pandemic as a direct-to-consumer, climate-neutral certified brand. <laughs> and this led to over 100 clients placing orders online, 19% of them placing reorders, and a less than 1% return rate. Last month, we had our first in-person fashion show during New York Fashion Week, and Vogue Business featured us as New York Sustainable New Guard. And so we're now expanding production to indigenous artisans around the world, which will bring jobs that uplift rural communities, especially for women, and keep their biocultural heritage and traditional know-how alive. As for the global impact, our collection aligns with these 10 UN Sustainable Development Goals. And so working with artisans is not only good for the planet, it's a big market. Personal luxury goods combined with the creative manufacturing and handmade sector is a combined $1 trillion addressable market for us. And so beyond our line, we've also been approached by many international brands about collaborations and consulting. And these partnerships are a huge opportunity to buoy our existing brand by accelerating brand awareness, by scaling up production, and creating alternative sources of revenue. Over the past 10 years, we've built the supply chain to produce at scale, and so now is the time to invest in marketing. And so we're currently raising up to $3 million to add sales and marketing, to design more collections, and to expand production globally. If you'd like to see the collection, it's on view this week at the SoCap Marketplace, which is right next to the registration desk. <laughs> and so swing by, and I'll be happy to tell you more. Thank you. Thank you, Angel. So you've heard from two founders preserving ancient craftsmanship from indigenous communities and tribes. Now you're going to hear from a founder who is preserving one of the most precious assets that we have on Earth, water. 80% uh, of all industrial and residential wastewater are minimally treated or untreated before discharge into receiving water bodies. And this is having devastating impacts on human health and also the environment. Our fellow Dr. Oriana Bratschker has invented a breakthrough technology to rapidly treat wastewater and recover energy as direct electricity. Please welcome Oriana. Thank you so much. Pleasure to be here today. So I'm going to turn a really sharp corner with you all. This is interactive. Okay. So why wastewater? Well, we're going to tell a little bit of that story. How many of you have used one of these? Pretty much all of us on a camping trip, right? How many of you have used one that looks like this? How about having to do this? One third of the world's population. This is their daily, this is their daily every day, right? And in fact, it's preferable to use an unstable pit latrine um, you know, open defecation is preferable to an unsafe pit latrine. And the reason that we still have open defecation today is because wastewater treatment as we know it is extremely expensive, requires a massive amount of infrastructure, is prohibitive in, in most countries to adopt, requires highly skilled operators to operate, and a whole lot of electricity to keep running. And a little known fact, wastewater treatment that we employ today, water and wastewater treatment, actually generates more greenhouse gas emissions than the entire shipping industry. So if we were to sewer that 80% of the population uh, that, that doesn't have access to adequate sanitation, we would reach our limits in terms of greenhouse gas emissions really, really fast. AquaCycle solved these issues. We have a sustainable approach for distributed sanitation which uses a bioelectrochemical system, taking advantage of natural microbial processes to both generate electricity at the same time that we clean the, clean the water. Each one of our units is about the size of a standard car battery. And we stack these little batteries together like Legos inside a shipping container, and we plug and play on site for a small community or an industrial client. We're actually starting an industry so that we can scale our manufacturing and address some of the serious issues that that industry is facing today. 
Our first client is Pepsi Cola. We've been operating with them on one of their sites for over a year and a half, saving them net 30% on their sewer bill and mitigating over 100 tons of greenhouse gases every single month in a single 40-foot container. So our goal, working with PepsiCo, working with other industries, and ultimately working into distributed sanitation, is to take these little batteries, bring them to a point where they are extremely cost-effective, and bring distributed sanitation to areas in the world that need it the most. And so we're very excited to move forward. Uh, we do have a round open. I'm more than happy to talk to anybody about that. Uh, we're scaling up with some of the major brands, some of the first lead platinum distilleries in the United States, and uh, major CPG companies helping them protect healthy watersheds and communities worldwide. Thanks very much. Thank you, Oriana. So the next fellow that you're going to hear from is also tackling the problem of waste. And her friends even called her the trash queen. So what uh, triggered her entrepreneurial journey is a simple question from consumers in Mexico. Where can I recycle this? Let's listen to Lizette's answer. Hi, my name is Lizette Cordero. I'm from Mexico. And have you ever think about recycle, recycling something but don't know where to recycle? Well, that happens every time with all the consumers because the consumers are confused. They want to recycle, but they don't know where to recycle. So um, they want to know what type of plastic they have in their hands and they want to contribute to circular economy, but don't know how. So that's why we created a map for Mexico where we have located all the collection centers in Mexico. Most of them are formal and the others are informal. So we arranged this part of where to recycle. How we do it, how Ecolana uh, pro is for profitable is we connect the consumer to the brand because the brands want to connect with the consumer in order to tell them where to recycle. Also, we connect with a recycler and with the collection center. The collection centers are the warehouses that buy and sell recyclables. And in Mexico and Latin America, they recycle, they collect more than the 50% that is recycled. So they are the key stakeholders in the value chain. What are our services? We make consultancy for CPGs. We make campaigns uh, for recycling. We also make communication in our, in our social media and in our platform. We have an app that you can scan the barcode of, the, the barcode of any package and they will tell you where to recycle. And we also uh, do large volumes because we go manually visit these collection centers, this informal collection center, and ask them to collect more recyclables. This is uh, several of our clients that we work in Mexico. And the impact that we have done is that we have more than 500,000 uh, 500, searches in our platform. We have more than 60,000 downloads and we have more than 10,000 of products scanned by the consumer. And we also have the biggest collection center database in Mexico and we have recycled more than 4,000 tons recycled. Our expansion is to go to Peru and Colombia and recycle because our system can apply to other parts of Latin America and we want to recycle more than 12,000 tons and to reach more than 1 million users. What are we looking for in two years? Grants uh, and an investment and improvements in our app because right now all this um, scanning and revising all the information of the products, it's manually, but we want to apply AI. And of course, we want to expansion to Latin America because our clients, the partners in Latin America are looking for us. And that's a Colana. If you want to contact me, just come here and we want to connect for recycling. Thanks, Lizette. So you have heard from uh, some of our fellows creating opportunities and preserving the planet. Now I'm going to introduce you to four healthcare entrepreneurs on the mission to improve our lives. Dr. Kelly Guin is one of our 2020 fellows. She's a serial entrepreneur and her newest venture has already become a tech leader in highly scalable remote patient monitoring. 
Please welcome Kelly. Thank you, Meng. Twenty twenty, during the year of um, in the midst of a um, global lockdown, we were living in a lot of fear, and we we couldn't even call or meet up or give hugs to our loved ones. COVID nineteen took away the lives of more than one million patients in the U.S. Healthcare systems were overfilled with overcapacity pressures. Patients living with chronic illnesses were suddenly cut off from their care. And did you know that chronic illnesses each year takes away the life of 1.7 patients in the U.S. alone at a cost of over $4 trillion? And that's where our company has been um, doing R&D for, for around five years. And um, it didn't really take off until the pandemic hit, when all the patients were at home and um, the care to their providers and clinics were very challenged. So uh, Medicare and a lot of the payers began to cover some of the work that we were doing and reduce the um, limitations and the um, you know, the, the limitations for that. So um, that's where we, um, it's Dr. Kumo, and our mission is to revolutionize connected health. And what we do is we, um, we connect it, like we have um, a group of the cybersecurity data scientists in our team, along with healthcare professionals like myself and other physicians, nurses, and um, pharmacists, uh, medical assistants. So we work together to build a platform. Uh, it is a SaaS software as a service subscription to enable physicians and clinics and hospitals to understand the patient's vital signs in real time and modify the care plan in accordance to the patient's state of being. And we challenged the conventional way of before the pandemic, where if a patient has hypertension and you go in only once a month, once every three months, and take a snapshot, we say that that is not the most optimal care for the patients. And so um, we, um, in our ecosystem, we take care of the patients at the comfort of their homes. The providers can get reimbursement using our technology, and the health care and the payers reduce, avoid unnecessary hospitalizations. We've grown a lot. We've had a lot of numerous um, awards um, from the national and, and global um, awards, and we ask you, if you believe in what we do, to support, talk to us, reach out to us, be our clients, our customers, our collaborators. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Kelly. So our next founder is also, uh, has also designed a solution for patients living with chronic diseases, but in sub-Saharan Africa. So rates of deaths from chronic disease in a region are rising in a rapidly rate, and it's rising faster than anywhere else. And her company has built a digital platform for healthier Africa, and is now expanding geographically. Let's listen to Neka Mobison, co-founder and CEO of MDoc. Thank you so much, Meng. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Neka Mobison. I'm co-founder and CEO of MDoc. And we provide virtual self-care health coaching to people living with chronic health needs in primarily Nigeria. We do this by leveraging data, behavioral science, as well as quality improvement methods and tech. So essentially, we're headquartered in Nigeria, and I have a team of over 55 um, employees my background is that I'm a pediatrician as well as an engineer. So you see before you a picture of my father. My father was a middle-class uh, Nigerian professor who essentially died prematurely due to complications from a massive stroke that he had at the age of 52, largely because he did not have access to a medical team to support him in managing his uncontrolled hypertension. 
The reality is that my father's situation is not unique. More than 320 million Africans are living today with diabetes and hypertension. Of that, the WHO estimates that 20% will die prematurely, preventably, from these diseases if the status quo does not change. At MDOC, we're working to, to tackle that. We provide a virtual integrated care platform, essentially that leverages a four-pillar approach. Here you see that we provide an omni-channel proprietary platform called Complete Health, which provides virtual nudges through our coaches who support people primarily on lifestyle modifications for the 99.9% .9 of the time that they're out of a hospital. However, we leverage our NaviHealth.ai, essentially a geocoded director of health services, facilities, and providers, to support them to find quality in-person care when that's needed. We recognize that mobile phone and smartphone penetration rates are not appropriate proxies for digital literacy, and so we've created an in-person coaching experience through our tech-enabled community nudge hubs, as well as through roving community ambassadors who meet people at the mosque, at churches, in the market to support them on how to onboard onto the digital platform and live their healthiest life. All of this is bolstered through our tele-education platform that, where we provide education to both doctors nurses, and other types of providers, as well as patients. We're really proud of what we've been able to deliver. Um, today, we serve over 100,000 people in Nigeria, majority of whom make less than $3 a day. So markets women, drivers, traders. A majority of the people that we serve are actually women. Today, we serve over 82% um, of our members being women. And about 77% 77, 77, um, actually have smartphones, hence the need for our USSD and SMS integration into our enable, AI-enabled chatbots. We run a B2B to C subscription-based model where we provide annualized contracts to employees, employers and other corporates where we provide support to their beneficiaries. And then we also run a B2C side where we provide tier-based subscription pricing to individuals with our most popular tier being 60 cents a month to, to receive virtual health coaching. Today, we've ensured that over our, our, our members with hypertension have seen sustained reductions in hypertension as well as glycemic control, and we're aligned with the SDG um, target three specifically. We're saving lives. And it's this work that's being presented in conferences around the world, as well as being submitted for peer-reviewed publications. It's through our partners, partnerships that we're able to save lives and we're hoping to partner with many of you today in the room. We'll be kicking off a raise at the end of Q2 next year, and we hope to reach over 200,000 more members across Kenya, Ghana, and Southern Africa, and we hope that you'll join us to ensure a healthier, happier, and more productive Africa. Thank you. Thank you, Neka. And now, please join me in welcoming Ting Shi, founder of Click Medics, a global mobile health social enterprise. Ting's company is bringing affordable and quality healthcare services to underserved patients. Let's find out more about her solution. Hi, everyone. Click Medics was born out of MIT with the audacious mission of improving the health of over a billion people. In order to do that as quickly as possible, what we do is to enable existing health organizations that are already serving various communities by providing them with technology in telemedicine, in AI, and in automation. Here's how it works. Patient will come through to a health facility. A health worker typically will provide screening services with a variety of Bluetooth-enabled devices. And our system will then provide a triage level of the diagnosis and a risk level and determine what is the next best action. It could be to connect with a remote doctor, could be to go to a clinic, or go to an actual local pharmacy. It also generates step-by-step follow-up plan so that the patient can be fully treated. The system also learns from this process and gets smarter at the next diagnosis, at the next treatment. The first project we did was in Botswana. And in Botswana, we trained just four health workers on cervical cancer screening. And in that one summer of three months, they literally saved the lives of 96 women who had cervical cancer and didn't know they could be treated. 
And since then, the government of Botswana has adopted the program and generates over a million dollars in savings annually. So why stop there? We expanded globally. We're currently deployed in 20, more than 20 countries, 24 and counting. We serve over 2 million patients, and we created 3,500 and running new jobs. And of the patient population we service, 70% of them didn't even know they had a disease. For those we found could be treated, we've lowered the cost of their treatment by 50 to 90%. And for those patients who otherwise would never see a doctor, they were treated within three days. And our business model is we sell the software to both public and private sector health organizations. They pay us a setup fee as well as a per user per month fee. The system not only manages massive number of patients and variety of diseases, it's also able to predict when that disease is going to get worse, and most importantly, it can prevent the disease from worsening. We're compared to lots of other software solutions such as medical records, AI chatbots, and telemedicine platforms. What we are is an all-in-one solution that is at a lower cost than any of the other solutions. Our plan to increase our impact is to scale what we have currently and grow the health worker workforce to over 20,000 within the next five years. We're also scaling our door-to-door -door programs in Latin America, in Africa. In the U.S., we work on dementia care, and we provide a population health AI solution to insurance companies. And with the growth trajectory, we will be able to serve over 14 million patients. Our team consists of serial entrepreneurs in technology and healthcare. We have a team of engineers as well as well-renowned medical experts. And we're here to ask for your partnership and for you to innovate and invest in the future of healthcare so that together we can actually reach over a billion people. Thank you. Thank you, Tien. So our last founder pitching today is John. He is the co-founder and CEO of Nonspec, and he's here to represent our fellow Aaron Keeney, who is unfortunately not able to join us today. So do you know that three million amputations are carried out every year? However, only a small portion of people can afford um, prosthetic limbs because of their high cost. John and Aaron, they have come up with a solution to produce limb kits for clinics to easily feed amputees without uh, specialized training or tools, and all this at an affordable price. Let's take a look at John and Aaron's solution. Thank you. So the mission of Nonspec is relatively simple. Our goal is to provide clinics with adjustable and affordable devices that they can scale to effectively any patient. We do this because the clinics we work with don't have the time or the resources to fit the massive backlog of patients that currently exists. And we really believe that if we can do this, every amputee will have a chance to walk again. Right now, there's about 54 million amputees. The vast majority of them, about 35 million, will never receive a device. Of those that do, the wait time on average, including in the developed world, is over two years. And this has to do with just how many clinicians there are. There aren't that many. I used to joke that if you took everyone in the US, you could fill a small ballroom with all of the specialized people. This is a huge problem, and it gets more complicated as you leave uh, developed nations, just because of the cost of fitting. I'll never forget one of the first patients we ever worked with. She was a young woman. She had been working as a nurse in the hospital we were treating her at, and she had literally just taken a double shift. She was tired, and she got into an accident in the parking lot. And she had been waiting for three and a half years, because she lost her job when she wasn't able to complete her normal tasks. We realized we had to do a better job. So we created an off-the-shelf kit that can be fit in under an hour by a minimally trained technician. The core device contains all of the equipment needed to ensure a reliable, world-class fit. And by standardizing the components, we are actually making it possible to leverage economies of scale in this field. Right now, we're able to undercut the traditional fitting of a prosthetic by 50% against donated limbs, just because of the amount of time we can save. As a result of this, our patients are up on their feet that much faster. In the, in the clinics that we work with, we go out of our way to work directly with the people in the community. There's always a few people who are artisans and they make components, and we do our best to incorporate their technologies and their approaches. It's important for adoption. For the amputees that use our limb, they're able to go back to what they love to do. That young woman who's been working on our leg, I think it's now been five and a half years, she still texts us to let us know what she can do. 
And it's little things. It's like I walked my daughter to school. But it makes such a big difference when you have the ability to make those changes. We've deployed this device on over 500 patients across hundreds of clinics, and we primarily have been making sales in large bulk units. But the trick is, it's hard to scale this without more manufacturing. We're currently seeking additional funding to allow us to get through that manufacturing gap and to scale up our product. This will allow us to make larger orders and actually bring us to a point where we'll be able to take these devices to the next phase, which is actually deploying them without a clinician. And that's our current plan. With your help, we're really hoping to build out the partnerships needed to ensure that in the future, when a patient goes to a clinic, they're not just going to be fit, they're going to be fit in the same day and they'll walk out of there under their own power. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. Thank you to everyone for listening to our eight founders today. And if you're interested in their businesses, please just come over after the session to talk to them um, or to explore collaboration opportunities with them. So now I would like to invite another special guest, our jury member, Caroline von Hitchberg, uh, on stage to say a few words and wrap up the session. So Caroline is an ecosystem builder, and she's the co-CEO of Spring Activator. She's on a mission to bridge mission-driven um, impact-driven entrepreneurs with impact investors. Please welcome Caroline. Thank you. Wow, that was inspiring. Thank you so much. Um, so yes, I'm Caroline and I'm co-CEO at Spring Activator. We're a global accelerator and advisory firm that's on a mission to build a world in which every entrepreneur is an impact entrepreneur and every investor is an impact investor and we're tackling barriers to doing that. So I'm absolutely thrilled and honored to have heard from each of you. Thank you for sharing your incredible work, creating innovative, sustainable, and importantly, scalable solutions, approaching approaches to tackling global problems today. But first, I wanted to take a moment to really acknowledge and applaud each of you, not just for your compelling presentations, but, and I have been on the other side of, of the, the fence as an entrepreneur pitching. I want to recognize the sweat and the tears, the long hours of testing, iterating, pivoting, um, all that you've been through to get here today. We see you. Secondly, I also want to recognize the holistic and inclusive approaches that each of you are taking. You're tackling really multi-layered issues affecting multiple stakeholders and often with really complex supply chains and that really isn't easy work and i really loved hearing how each of you were really listening to and designing with your consumers your customers and your partners in the process and lastly each of you were ready to scale and the real question for all of us in the room today is how each of us can support you to deepen and scale your impact. So whether you're an investor, donor, ally, fellow entrepreneur, or in fact, do any of you buy clothes or have a social media account, in which case you can support these incredible entrepreneurs. Um, so before lunch, because I appreciate that is what's next on the agenda, I ask each of you to think about at least one way in which you can support one, at least one of these entrepreneurs. So just take a moment, write it down, type it down. But my ask is for you to think about a tangible way in which you can support these entrepreneurs. And with that, thank you very much and bon appetit. <laughs>